Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Terry Stiles. In this week's news, a special seal for bilingual students. The Oxford Leader draws honors from the American Press Association and a fundraiser makes waves to help a swimmer with cancer. Stay tuned. Learn more about these stories and others. The Oxford News begins right now. Last week, the Village of Oxford discussed the proposed 2018-2019 budget, and resident Rose Bema wants to know how the $800,000 general fund monies will be managed. Bema, who worked for the Village for 30 years and served on the Council from 2014 to 2016, suggested to Council that while discussing their upcoming budget approval, some money should go towards improving Village streets. A mass transit tax proposal is potentially making its way to our local ballots again, according to Addison Township Supervisor Bruce Pearson, who went to Lansing last week to voice his opinion about it. Pearson was one of four township supervisors from North Oakland County who testified before the Michigan House Tax Policy Committee. The proposed bill would allow townships, villages, and cities to opt out of the Regional Transit Authority of Southeast Michigan, RTA. The other supervisors were Chris Barnett from Lake Orion, Pat Kittle from Independence Township, and George Cullis from Holly Township. Nathan Beltramo knows how to make an entrance. Last week, the 2016 Oxford High School graduate piloted a helicopter to Oxford High School. He landed the aircraft on a practice field and spoke to students in teacher Dan Balsley's auto technology program classroom. Beltramo did a show and tell with students telling them the sky is the limit in the aviation world, literally, when it comes to applying what they learn in auto technology class. Bilingual students in the Oxford Public Schools will soon be able to receive special recognition on their diplomas and their transcripts, according to the Michigan Department of, Ed of Education, which launched the program earlier this year. The Oxford Board of Education unanimously approved a resolution in support of the program last week. According to Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction, Ken Weaver, the district is making an effort to ensure qualifying 2018 graduates will receive the seal on their diplomas this year. Eight students are under consideration to receive the seal. The Oxford High School Swim and Dive Team, Oxford's Aqua Swim Club, and the Liquid Lightning Swim Team came together to raise money for OHS senior Claire Alexander. Alexander is a varsity swimmer who was recently diagnosed with cancer. So about 200 swimmers raised approximately $2,500 to help the Alexander family. Initially suggested by the OHS varsity team, the Aqua Swim Club swimmers, Zach Beatty, and Peyton Bailey fundraising efforts were then uh, organized by the Aqua Swim Club as well. Ready? May 10th was a big night for the Oxford Leader during the evening's Michigan Press Association annual convention and gala in East Lansing. Leader editor C.J. Carnacchio received seven awards in the paper circulation class for the MPA's for 2017 Better Newspaper Contest. The weekly newspaper has been around since 1898 and has been owned by the Sherman family since 1955. CJ also came in third for the Newspaper of the Year Award in the weekly circulation Class D. I want to say congratulations on a personal level and thank you to the Sherman public Publications for our news that we do here. And that is CJ's 100th. 100, I said, awards. Congratulations, CJ. 
And an Addison Township couple is one step closer to opening a new golf business. The Oxford Township Board voted 6-0 to zero to approve a new Class C liquor license for Birdie's Indoor Golf and Bar. The bar will be located inside the Oxford Crossing Strip Mall adjacent to the Meyer store. Thomas Morsey is the liquor license applicant and business owner. His girlfriend, Megan Hessup, will be full-time manager. That's it for Oxford News this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories or others, you can pick up a copy of the Oxford Leader newspaper, or better yet, catch us on our website, occtv.org, on YouTube, and of course, not Charter Channel, it's um, Spectrum Channel 191, or AT&T Channel 99. Coming up soon, John Oceans with the School News and OCTV's very own Cody Wright with the sports, and you won't want to miss Auto Talk and Science in the News with Dave Kenny. I'm Terry Stiles. Thanks for watching Oxford News this week, where we bring your news closer to home. And I'm Elgin Nichols. Remember, always be kind to your friends and neighbors, and thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Elgin Nichols. And I'm Dave Kenny. Together, David and I host OCTV's weekly show, Minutes by Minutes. The show presents our sometimes humorous interpretation of what your elected politicians are doing to enact regulations and ordinances that ultimately affect us all. Keeping your news closer to home and reporting political shenanigans from Oxford and Addison Township, including the villages of Leonard and Oxford. Catch Minutes by Minutes on Charter Channel 191 or AT&T Channel 99. Tune in Monday through Friday, 11.30 a.m. and 11.30 p.m. and Saturday, 11.30 a.m. If you don't have Charter or AT&T, you can watch us on our local website, OCCTV.org or OCTV Oxford, Michigan on YouTube. See, See you there. there. <laughs> Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication, New Scientist. In our first story, the inside of a proton is under a lot of pressure. The particle center withstands a billion, billion, billion times the pressure found at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Volker Burkhardt and his colleagues at the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility in Newport News, Virginia, made the first measurement of the intense conditions inside a proton. And they had to use a bit of trickery to do so. Protons are made up of three fundamental particles called quarks, which are held together by a force originating from other particles called gluons. To probe this minuscule material, Burkhardt and his team fired an electron beam at a proton. The electron carried with it a packet of energy that behaves like a photon, a particle of light, which it passed off to one of the quarks. When the electron bounced off one quark, the entire proton recoiled in response and the quark emitted another high-energy photon. Measuring how the electron, the proton, and the photon are moving at the end of the experiment, including their momenta and the angles at which they came away from the collision, let the researchers create a 3D map of the quarks inside the proton. But that map doesn't directly tell us about the forces within the proton. To measure that, we'd need a theoretical particle called a graviton. But that's the carrier of gravity, but no one's found one yet. And that's where the trick comes in. Information from two photons can be combined to essentially mimic what a graviton would tell us. The two photons here, the one absorbed at the beginning of the experiment and the one emitted at the end, probe this system as if it were a single graviton, Burkhardt said. This loophole gets us the same information without the need for a direct gravitational probe. Now we can really probe the heart of the proton, says collaborator Latifa Elahurdiri. The researchers found intense pressures of about 10 to the 35 pascals. That's 10 times the pressure inside a neutron star, which is the densest known object in the universe. That density is a result of extreme pressures. But protons withstand even more. The quarks at a proton center are pressed tightly together and straining outward to escape with a huge amount of force. Toward the outer edges of the proton, the team also found a confining pressure likely created by gluons that hold back the quarks. Good thing, or the proton would explode, and we all know what that is. Spell H-bomb. Okay, <laughs> and our next article, a study suggests that eating all your meals in a six-hour window may prevent diabetes. 
Courtney Peterson at the University of Alabama in Birmingham and her colleagues tested a time-restricted diet in eight overweight men who were all on the threshold of developing type 2 diabetes. For five weeks, the volunteers ate identical breakfasts, lunches, and dinners. Half were assigned to eat all three meals within a six-hour period, ending no later than 3 p.m., while the other four ate within a more typical 12-hour time period. After five weeks, the group swapped for a further five weeks. The time limit led to improved sugar control. The team also saw drops in overall appetite and blood pressure. These effects were not due to a weight loss, since everyone ate enough to maintain their weight. Instead, eating earlier in the day may align better with circadian rhythms. We've evolved to be active during the day, so it makes sense for our metabolism to rev up at the beginning of the day and rev down at night to be as efficient as possible, says Peterson. Wow. And on the frog front, a deadly disease that is wiping out the world's frogs and toads probably originated in the Korean Peninsula. Amphibians infected with the chytrid fungus Batraco chytridium, tridium, uh, dendrobatitis, or BD, thank God it's got a BD, then <clears throat> to die of heart attacks. It has wiped out 2,200 of the world's 7,800 amphibian species and infected at least 700. Matthew Fisher of Imperial College London and his colleagues have spent 10 years figuring out where chytrid came from by studying its gen genetics. The team examined 234 samples of the fungus from all over the world. They found oriental fire-bellied toads from South Korea carried an undocumented variant. Fisher believes this is the mother strain that started the current epidemic. BD Asia 1 carries unique genetic sequences that must have evolved during a long isolation. The other strains are younger than BD Asia 1 and probably originated from it. The team also used their data to show that the lethal strains popped up in the early to mid 20th century. This was an ideal time for the fungus to escape Korea. Global trade was expanding, oh, and there were world wars to boot. It's one genome that got into one individual amphibian and then you have the chain of infection that goes global, says Fisher, and that's too bad for frogs. Well, that's it for this edition of Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television. I'm John Ochens and welcome to the Oxford Wildcats School Update. Springtime is exhibition time in IB schools and we're no exception. Rita Flynn is one of our elementary IB coordinators over at Oxford Elementary. We stopped by and spoke to her about the significance of fifth grade exhibition. I just tell the students like you're making a big difference that you're sharing all of this valuable research that you gained but we're hoping that we plant seeds that we encourage others to take action and make change in the world. So for example, um, a student that may be you know, researching, we just had a student up here that was researching bullying. You know, after they hear the consequences of bullying, the victim, different perspectives of the bullying, we hope that when a student sees that presentation, they'll think to themselves, oh, you know, I want to make better choices in school. I want to make better choice in school because bullying is a real issue and affects many different kids. Um, and they, the students get perspective on that too. So for instance, we had Pam Fine from the high school come in and talk to our students in regards to bullying. So she said, you know, you know, these are certain issues that our kids are dealing with and they're able to make that connection with them as well. So there was actually an app that was really detrimental in the kids' lives that was happening at the high school and the bully busters put a stop to it and she was able to share that story. Check out some of the topics these kids have chosen. Um, I do mental illness and health. Um, it's a little bit pieces about some types of mental illness. Um, I'm doing a little bit of depression, OCD, 
and uh, like the eating disorders. My topic is op is the opioid epidemic. Um, I picked it because it's like it's um it's like been happening for years and it's like a very big problem in the community. And my um quote is your life matters to other people do not let anyone tell you otherwise and I'm doing school shootings and I chose this topic because it is a problem it's been going on for a very long time and they have not like fixed the problem or like solve it or at least make it worse like to make it a little bit um, harder for the person to do a school shooting sure. And mine was, don't let anyone make f make you feel bad, and if they do make you feel bad, ask a friend or teacher to help you in trying to make you happy. I asked Rita about their attention to some of these timely topics. They're getting a little more intense, and I think because they're well informed, so the, what they're being exposed to through like students, CNN News, it's what they've seen and what, you know, they've been hearing about these hot talk up top topics throughout the year and if something sticks with them they'll say to themselves like oh that's something I really want to dig deeper into uh, but yeah they are pretty serious but I think because their interest is so high it sticks with them these are fifth graders science live came to Daniel Axford the other day we sent our Kyle Snage over to check out the kids and the critters Terry Neal was in charge she tells us a bit about the organization Oh, we are an education group that is designed to uh, go into schools, um, but we do a lot of other educational things. So we're biologists, um, teachers, and uh, we go to uh, do a lot of libraries, park and rec programs. But our major focus is getting into biology, into the young of the younger kids, and, and uh, some of our older. And what adults was your, as what's well. your favorite part about doing the program? Uh, we are, well, that's a favorite part. It is working with the kids as well as with the animals, so it kind of gives us a, a nice little um, uh, taste of both where you've got the enjoyment of the kids having a fascination with the animals and getting them uh, prepared for other things in their life. Yeah, we can do a lot of things from private birthday party parties to uh, schools to libraries. Uh, we do some different festivals and stuff. So yeah, any of a, anybody can contact us. We can do a number of different things. Did you know that Clear Lake Elementary has a green team? Well, they do, and it's the only one in our district. It's also at the top of the list of this sort of project with Oakland schools. Parent Danielle Corrigan heads it up and tells us more about it. Yeah, the green team, we, um, we teach kindergarten through fifth grade here about some of the stuff um, impacting our state as far as the environment and invasive species. And right now we're out here in the nature area. We've got native plants and we've got a garden and we've got a compost bin. Uh, 11 years ago, um, Oakland County started the green schools and they every year honor all the schools that have gotten 10 points up to 20 points. And uh, this year we actually were honored um, with the highest for the Evergreen. Evergreen is the highest you can get. Um, that's 20 or more points on the um, application, just doing different things. And we did 39 points, so we were honored as the top Evergreen school this year. We even got a little tour. Okay, the green team is in front of us. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what we've got going over here. Right now we're in our nature area and this over here is all of our native Michigan plants which are really good for all the native bees and pollinators and we've got bird feeders and bee houses. We've got some thyme in here and we've got a little bird bath. And like a big rock. Right. We have lots of rocks. We have to try and keep the pack. Yeah, you can walk all in right. there. Keep going, keep going. And we've got our bird bath here. Have you guys watched this one? And then we've got strawberries here because they're a nice native plant. We've already got some growing. And this in about another week or so, we'll have all the flowers in here. Then off to the left over here too, we've got a compost bin, and we've got some ladybug habitats, lots of wild flowers. We come out here about once a month and we have the bird seed. We get filled the bird seed and look for frogs and birds and lots of bees and stuff. Now this group starts in the fall, you said. What kind of stuff do you do yep. in the fall? Um, in the fall, the first thing we usually do is we adopt, a, um, we have the kids uh, vote on adopting an animal from the Detroit Zoo and it's an endangered animal and then we raise money and send it to the zoo. Um, we do a lot of, we come outside and do like nature uh, 
just looking at nature and looking at different kinds of things. And we try and come out once during the winter and look for tracks, like bird tracks, and we'll see what kind of squirrels are out here and that kind of stuff. Diane Lucas Noah is a kindergarten teacher who also helps out with the green team over there. Nice to see some green out there, huh? That's the Oxford School Update for this week. This is Oxford Community Television, keeping it local. What's going on Wildcat fans? Cody right here once again to bring you this week's sports report. Um, we do not have a ton to report on this week, just going to update a few scores. Uh, but let's not forget this spring season is on its way out. A lot of these sports are either in playoffs right now or just finishing the regular season. Um, so anyways, let's just dive in and check out how this last week went. Um, first off, the boys varsity baseball team got hit hard on the 14th here at home against Lake Orion. It was a rough game and what really killed us was errors in the field. Uh, we fell apart officially at the end. Final score ended up being 14 to 5. Um, but also on the flip side, the JV boys played well in their double header on the road against Lake Orion. Uh, 6 to 2 and 9 to 7, both wins. And then the very next day, JV took them on again here at home and took the win once more, 6 to nothing. Um, but girls softball, on the other hand, is absolutely dominating this season. Uh, taking on Brandon on the 15th on the road, Varsity takes the win. No contest, 14 to nothing. JV, same story, 18 to nothing and 15 to nothing as they played a doubleheader. Uh, these girls could just take it really far this season and we're really looking forward to see uh, what comes next. Um, also, boys lacrosse continues to struggle. We fell 8 to 1 against Rochester Adams on the 15th. And then on the 16th, we took on Davison here at home and really struggled falling 10 to 1. Uh, the girls lacrosse played as well this week. On the 14th, both JV and Varsity took on, um, at, well, they played here at home. Varsity took on Clarkson and fell in a high scoring game 16 to 11. And JV was successful taking the win 16 to 14. Uh, the very next day, Varsity took on Rochester on the road and fell once again in a high scoring game. The final score was 10 to 6. Um, can't forget about the girls soccer team who took on Royal Oak and Clarkson this week on the road. Against Royal Oak, Varsity is successful 3-1. JV does fall short 1-0, very low scoring. Uh, Clarkston is the other way around. Uh, Varsity falls 2-1 and JV takes the win 2-0. And last but certainly not least, the girls JV tennis team took on Lance Cruz North falling 6-2. Not what we saw on the 10th. Uh, when Varsity and JV both took on, both took the win against Anchor Bay. Varsity 7 to 1 and JV 8 to nothing. Anyhow, that's all for this week's uh, report, folks. Like I said, this season is on its way out, so don't forget to mark your calendars for these last events. Uh, you can find all the info you need for this at OxfordAthletics.org. Plenty of game breakdowns and statistics all right there for you to find at OxfordAthletics.org. Uh, while you're at it, might as well check us out at OCCTV.org. All of our coverage of these events and more can be found on our YouTube page, which can be accessed through the website. Once again, that is OCCTV.org. And that's going to do it for me this week. I want to thank you all for watching and remind you to tune in next time. But until then, I'm Cody Wright. Go Wildcats! Welcome to this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from the publication Automotive News. In our first story, Mobileye, Intel's Israeli based autonomous driving unit, has signed a contract to supply 8 million cars at a European automaker with its self driving technologies, a company official told Reuters. Financial terms of the deal and the identity of the automaker were not disclosed. 
The deal, one of the largest yet for Mobileye, is a sign of how car makers and suppliers are accelerating the introduction of features that can automate certain driving tasks such as highway driving and emergency braking to generate revenue, while technology to enable fully automated driving in all conditions is still years away from mass market deployment. The deal for the Advanced Driver Assisted Systems will begin in 2021 when Intel's IQ5 chip, which is designed for fully autonomous driving, is launched as an upgrade to the IQ4. That will be rolled out in the coming weeks, says Erez Dagon, Senior Vice President for Advanced Development and Strategy at Mobileye. Intel and Mobileye are competing with several rival chip and machine vision manufacturers, including NVIDIA, to provide the brains and eyes of automated cars. The future system will be available on a variety of the automaker's car models that will have partial automation where the car is automatically driven but the driver must stay alert as well as models integrating a more advanced system of conditional automation. Mobileye, brought by Intel last year for $15.3 billion, says there are some 27 million cars on the road from 25 automakers that use some sort of driver assistance system and Mobileye has a market share of more than 70%. By the end of 2019, we expect over 100,000 Level 3 cars with Mobileye installed, Mobileye CEO Amnon Sashua said. In Level 3, the car is self-driving, but the driver has about 10 seconds to take over if the system is unable to continue. Mobileye is working with a number of automakers such as General Motors for its Super Cruise system, Nissan, Audi, BMW, Honda and Fiat Chrysler to supply the Level 3 technologies by next year. At its Jerusalem headquarters, Mobileye is also testing a more advanced Level 4 technology in Ford Fusion hybrids with 12 small cameras installed and four on of the soon-to-be-released IQ4 chips in the trunk. In a test witnessed by Reuters reporters, these cars were able to drive on Jerusalem highways in midday traffic with no driver assistance. Mobileye says that while its Level 4 systems will start production in 2021, many of its technologies are relevant to creating systems that may soon be purchased by consumers. And on the recall front, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles is recalling more than 325,000 older model SUVs because of a flaw in their rear lower control arms. The voluntary recall affects Jeep Liberty SUVs from the 2004 to 2007 model years, the company said in a statement on May 10th. FCA U.S. is pulling almost 240,000 SUVs in the U.S., 50,000 in Mexico, and 36,000 outside the NAFTA region. The company said water could build up inside the components and cause corrosion and cracks, could, which could potentially undermine driver control. FCA U.S. is aware of a single potentially related accident, but no related injuries, the automaker said. Dealerships will replace the rear lower control arms in the affected vehicles and customers will be notified when they may schedule service. And still on the recall front, Mercedes-Benz USA is recalling 42,781 smart 4-2 vehicles in the U.S. after discovering a potential fire risk in the engine compartment. The recall covers 13,528 smart 2 convertibles and 29,253 smart 4-2 coupes from the 2008 to 2009 model years, according to a safety recall report. The rear insulation mat in the engine compartment could deform, deteriorate, and loosen over time, the report said. The mat's material could contact hot components in the exhaust system, increasing the risk of a fire. Owners will be notified in late June, and Mercedes-Benz dealerships will replace the insulation mats in the affected vehicles. A company spokeswoman said there have been no deaths or injuries reported. Well, that's all for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and as always, may the wind be at your back as you cruise down life's highways. Stay tuned to Oxford Community Television.